Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Lord's house this morning. There remain just three Sundays in this church year, and so today, the third last Sunday of the church year, uh, and it's a time that historically the church has turned its attention to the last day um, and, and to, uh, to the fact that, that it is coming at some point, and it's getting always nearer. So for the next uh, three weeks, our, our readings will invite us to consider that and to take that fact uh, seriously. Uh, sermon or the divine service is still number four as we've used for about the last month, and uh, we'll begin with our opening hymn. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies, 
and from those who persecute me. O Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Said, 
These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And Yahweh said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord, Yahweh, his God, and said, O oh, Yahweh, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger, and relent from the disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And Yahweh relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing upon his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tab tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of the feet, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing. Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire, ground it to powder, and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> your foes have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their own signs for signs. Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed, to be the tribe of your heritage. The epistle is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks to God. Please stand. <laughs> Jesus said, 
When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is there, the vultures will gather. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, Begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the day.
are the devil's workshop. And the devil likes to produce idols fashioned by the hands of sinful man. Moses had been gone almost 40 whole days. How could the people wait so long? They got impatient. They got bored. And so they took matters into their own idol-shaping hands. And they form a golden calf to worship. How quickly, how quickly they turn to other things. Now the devil likes to see us create idols or to make idols of things that are a part of this creation. Things like our own family, our own loved ones, our 401ks or pension or retirement plans, our job or our positions. And the loss of any of that, well, that would quickly make us question God. Does he exist? Does he care? Is he really good? We, like ancient Israel, are very good at making idols of things that make no sense to worship. And Satan likes to help us create these false gods, these false idols. And those gods actually tend to look an awful lot like we do. They're gods who generally agree with our politics, with our way of thinking, and what we think we really need or deserve. They're gods who almost always agree with us at almost every turn. Gods who reflect our values, our needs. They are, of course, false gods. And... Uh, and in their eyes, the way we imagine them, well, we end up looking pretty good. But they are gods we can also change, can't we? If our views and attitudes or our needs change. So no, make no mistake about it. We all too often take or make for ourselves false gods. By making the unimportant and temporal way too big a deal. Or, or the important so small that it's really hard to even worth noticing and worrying about. And all too often our false gods really at their heart are just us. They reflect what we want. That day at the base of Sinai, when it says they rose up to play, that wasn't a good thing. They weren't singing hymns and psalms, and their player prayer and their play would have been quite, quite detestable in God's eyes. But they were enjoying it. They were having fun, and it was way better than waiting for God and Moses. So in our own ways, we sit down to eat and drink, and then we rise up to play, seeking to serve our gods, indulging all sorts of mischief and sin under the auspices of our false and approving gods. And just as Jesus warned, this side of the last day, there is no shortage of false prophet and false Christ, false teachers and leaders, and would-be saviors. Many offering a new or a better take on things, perhaps a more loving and tolerant view of things and approach. Perhaps even more environmentally 
conscious and socially sensitive ways, friendlier ways of gaining God's favor, of earning or meriting our way into heaven. But like it or not, there is only one way. Just as there is only one true God, capital G, God. And He will return one day, on the last day. And we are, all of us, are but a short little nap away from that grand and glorious day. Now most won't recognize Him. They won't miss Him. None of us will miss it. You don't have to worry about missing the last day. Don't try to decode the signs, signs, because no one knows. But you're not going to miss it. But many won't recognize the true God when He returns because they have erected for themselves these false gods, the things they love and look to for their hope and happiness to all of the things they could never live in this world without. Those are false gods. You can't help but think sometimes, can you? Those foolish Israelites, what is wrong with them? Getting bored and distracted so quickly and easily and following a silly god on the heels of their deliverance from bondage and slavery in Egypt. What were they thinking? Forty days. I lose my patience after three or four. Maybe after a week or two. Forty days. What's wrong with them? What's wrong with me? You know, God probably should have wiped them out and then just started over with Moses. He would have been completely justified in doing so. They, like us, deserve temporal and eternal punishment for our sin. That's not what happened. He should probably wipe us out, along with all of our false gods and all the things we think we can't live without. All the gods we made and chase and serve. But Moses won't hear it. And he intercedes for the people by appealing to God and His very nature, to His goodness, to His mercy, and by appealing to the promises that God had made His people. And purely out of His divine goodness, God spares them. Oh, there are some important near-term consequences to their actions. But God spares them, saving His righteous anger for another who would one day stand in the place of rebellious Israel. Moses then comes down the mountain and he sees what has become of the people. He sees what they're doing. And he smashes the tablets. He tears down the golden cap, melts it down, spreads it on the water, and makes them drink it. As if to remind them, this is what good your gods are. And on the last day, all of our false gods will be rendered absolutely powerless and meaningless. Our wealth, our property, our farms, our equipment, our 401ks, our IRAs, our family, our friends, our houses, all or nothing when God returns. I suspect it's not 
too hard, I hope, for us to see the connection. We might want to argue, well, I don't have a golden calf in my house. I think I do have what I hope will one day be a golden IRA that I can use to retire. So perhaps I should be wary. So our false gods, all the things that we fear, love, and trust in more than we do the one and only true God, they represent our selfish and sinful rebellion against the only true God. And we, like ancient Israel, should be toast before this thrice holy God. But we, too, have an intercessor, don't we? One even greater than Moses. God's own Son Himself. Jesus the Christ. The one who once got so angry with what had become of his father's house, the temple, that he flipped over tables and kicked the money changers out for good. He is the same one who now intercedes for us. He pleads our case before a holy and righteous God so that we need not not now or ever have to face God's wrath and to be consumed by His perfect holiness. No, this other intercedes for us. He faced God's wrath. He was forsaken by God there on the cross. And as he intercedes, he knows well the cost. And he paid the price. His holy, precious blood. His bitter, awful, horrific suffering and death. The cost was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The one who took onto himself and shouldered the sins of the whole world. The one who put himself in our place to face God's wrath. And so we need not look anywhere else, people loved by God. We dare not make us or our way the way or the ticket to heaven. We must not turn toward or be tempted to trust the many false deliverers, the false messiahs or Christ and their false teachers. For there will be one last day. And not all will be spared. Whether we or they like it or not, that's the reality. But those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, those who have been reborn children of God by the washing of holy baptism, those who have freely confessed their sins and turned in faith to the Savior there once hung on the cross, they need not fear God's wrath. They will be raised together with all those who have gone before us in the faith. They will be raised. Their bodies glorified. Their immortality brought to light in a grand and glorious way. They will be raised, changed in an instant. And they, you, will meet your Savior face to face. Your Savior. The one with the scars in his hands and his feet and on his side. The one who will greet you and smile on that day. He will take you to be with him forever in paradise. 
No more false gods. No more false prophets or teachers. Just the one and only true God. Your God. Your Savior. Jesus the Christ. Do we deserve it? Not a chance. But by grace, He has made this truth ours. He has made it our future and present reality. What a God. What a way. What a promise. What a Savior. And He is yours. Amen. We stand for the prayer of the church. Oh, good and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you as children to a loving Father because you have invited us to do so. And because your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, has made it possible. We thank you for the countless blessings that you shower on us each and every day. Move us to share those blessings with others, both near and far, and work through us to care for all your people. Help us to focus on others rather than ourselves, and remind us that in serving others, we are best serving you. Oh Lord, Graciously regard our civic leaders. Teach them to care for all people, especially the youngest, smallest, and most helpless, the unborn and the neglected, as well as those now plagued with the infirmities of old age. Bend their selfish and often misguided wills so that they might lead according to your good and holy will. And Lord, be with those who serve your church. Keep them humble and faithful to your word. Help them to see their mistakes and errors. And help us all to contend for the true faith which comes to us from the apostles. Be with those who serve in our military and all who await their safe return. Bless their efforts and enable them to complete their service with courage, integrity, and honor. O oh Lord, continue to look down with compassion and mercy on all those suffering in the wake of this pandemic and in the aftermath of storms and all disasters, whether man-made or natural. Graciously consider those who work to bring aid and comfort and attend all who are sick, injured, or troubled in any way, and those who mourn. Be with those who have requested our prayers and those we now name in our hearts. Grant them peace, comfort, and healing according to your good and gracious will. Help us, O Lord, to face and admit our own sin and turn our otherwise hardened hearts back to Christ and to his cross in true repentance each and every day. Help us to stay awake and to be ready for the last day and to lift our focus from the here and now to the forever and eternal. Make us again and keep us as your dear children and fan into flame the faith you create and nourish so that we might serve you as we serve others. Share with us your patient love and endurance so that your love for all may readily flow through us and give us patience as we await your Son's glorious return. Into your hands, O Lord, we command all for whom we pray, trusting in your goodness and mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for you.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary. But we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. For the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love, shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh, and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you, and say... Peace of the Lord be with you always. 